I'm I'm Wera Kleni, I'm the project lead for Tingako Kahukura and so pleased to welcome you back for this fourth session in our Tapui and Rainbow webinar series for Aotearoa's youth sector. Today's Korero is about working with rainbow young people in rural areas and I'm joined by Nate and Slay from Waikato Kui Youth to talk more about that. But um, before I introduce them, I just want to say a little bit about Tingako Kahukura and what we're about. Um, so... Tingaku Kahukura is a national initiative that sits in partnership between Rainbow Communities and Arotaiohi, which is a national peak body for the youth sector. Our goal or our um, sort of vision, we want Rainbow young people to across Aotearoa to grow up feeling safe, valued and like they belong in all of the places where they live, learn and access healthcare and social support which sounds simple, sounds like something probably everybody would be on board with, but unfortunately it's still a really big copa but there's still really a lot of work to do um, and our team is quite small we're um, just four people so we work at a systems change level we work um, with people and with organizations who influence the systems around young people so um, funders politicians researchers training providers sector bodies um, government agencies and youth services to grow their understanding of rainbow populations and issues and to help people to do whatever work is needed really within their sphere of influence. Um, Dr. Elizabeth Kirikire, who helped us to come up with the name Tingakreka Hukura, also gave us a whakatoki that speaks to our work, which is up on the screen, Kia Puawai Me Puawai. So in order for our rainbow young people to thrive or to flourish, we must grow as well. We must do the work ourselves. So our work is really about helping people put in the groundwork to strengthen their um, services, grow their practice, um, do the work that they need to do to um, be able to stand up for and support our young people. And we've put together this free webinar series for anyone who works with young people across Aotearoa, whether that's directly working with them um, in their whanau in a one-on-one -on -one or in a group kind of way, or whether it's more supporting youth at a policy or a management level. And um, with this series, we want to get into some conversations that are little bit deeper than some of the 101 sort of introductory stuff about language or definitions or terminology. So we might not necessarily cover off all the questions that you have today. Um, really encourage you to ask questions if you have them, but also check out our website, read more, and please do get in touch if you want to ask us anything else. Um, actually, or if you want to suggest any um, topics for future webinars, things that you're interested in really digging into and hearing more about. For today, if you have a question, please pop it in the Q&A section um, at the bottom of your screen, probably depending what um, program you're using. Um, that's the easiest way for us to see it if you pop it in the Q&A. Um, and you're also welcome to use the chat function if you want to introduce yourself or to add any, anything, um, add any comments. Um, just make sure that you have it set to all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see um, what you're saying. So with that, let's get into it. Um, our speakers today, as I was saying, are Nathan and Slay from Waikato Kui Youth. Um, I'll tell you a bit about them and then hand over to, to them to introduce themselves further. Um, Nathan Bramwell is a transgender Pakeha man who grew up in an equally religious and liberally queer family. He attributes his strong moral compass and respect of diversity, visibility and autonomy to his grandmother who is a staunch lesbian and educator. He's the manager of Waikato Kui Youth, a community-led charitable organization that provides advocacy, education, referrals, and support for queer, gender, sex, and sexually diverse young people across the Waikato. Slay Wei is a gender fluid human. They grew up in Thames, so have a lived experience growing up as a gender sexually diverse youth in a rural community. Slay's gone on to launch their own wellbeing business, having completed a degree in sports science and human performance, and having recently finished the adult and tertiary teaching and practice qualification, Slay has a passion for enriching the lives of others through education, 
Um, and Slay is the education coordinator for Waikato for Youth and Rainbow Hub Waikato. So yeah, our kaupapa for today is around working with rainbow young people in rural communities and particularly hearing more about um, the work across the Waikato. So if I could hand over to um, maybe you, Nate, first to talk, uh, tell us a bit more about yourself and could you say more about your background working with rainbow young people in rural areas and or being a rainbow young person <laughs> in a rural area? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Waikato Kui Youth is very grassroots. It started from a very small cohort of people who cared, like most things that start in, in small places. Um, not that Hamilton's too small. Um, but it started from a couple of teachers who were like, hey, there's a couple of students here that really need support and, and grew. Um, and they welcomed people in from outside of Hamilton, um, and hence the name Waikato. Um, and it just grew from there. I think at the moment we're supporting 40 young people per night in our main Hamilton group, um, which is pretty pretty big and pretty loud. <laughs> um, and so we also have um, across the region groups that meet, um, as I call them satellite groups, but um, community grounded groups is, um, groups is what I would prefer um, them to be. <laughs> um, and so we focus on um, meeting young people where they are so they don't have to come to us because we used to in the past um, have parents or travel allowances basically that would bring people to um, Hamilton and we kind of changed our focus to be hey are we doing the right thing by young people by having it centered in this main metropolis and that's why I'm really passionate about this topic because um, a lot of times services try and bring the young people to their services um, Whereas the, the most difference comes from meeting them where they are. <clears throat> Sorry, meeting them where they are and um, making sure they're holistically supported where they're at. Because um, already with young um, people in, in rural townships, there's a huge, um, they're already trying to migrate out to find employment and education elsewhere because they feel a little bit small. Um, clustered in their little townships. So making all the difference we can while they're there. Um, and I suppose making it cool to stay in small towns. I suppose um, one of the young people um, at our regional groups um, said, oh, it's quite cool living here when I've got the support I need. I could, I could work here. And so they're now in a little cafe um, that we meet at actually, which is pretty, pretty cool. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm really, I've lived in a, the majority of my life in Hamilton um, as a young person attending Waikato Youth um, from age 16. So I, I kind of make the joke that I never left. <laughs> so I attended as a young person and just worked my way up the organisation and places that I could make the most difference. Um, I worked for a little bit um, for Rainbow Youth setting up, um, or not setting up, but helping to support um, the growth of the Bay of Plenty region for some of the rural communities. Um, and facilitating the conversations between the amazing work that was happening there. Um, so we we cover um, Waikato Queer Youth covers um, or Rainbow Hub Waikato as we are, as we are now <laughs> um, covers um, the Waikato and Hauraki, which is quite a very um, diverse region of all the little townships that are clustered in there, and how we engage in them differs to who we are engaging with, and it's it's exciting to. Um, meet different communities and for myself um, as I was learning what it meant to be um, a grassroots organization engaging with different communities your perceptions that you bring into that and then go hey what's happening in this community what's what can I um, feed into or grow here instead of being like hey you need this here because <laughs> I say so. Hmm. <laughs> Kia ora, how about you Slay and um, do you want to tell us a bit more about yourself and um, where you fit into the picture. Yeah, um, so kia ora e um, e mai awe hauraki, e noho ana ki nga rewaohia, um, he takatapui ahau, ko slay toku ingoa. So I grew up in the hauraki in a small town called Thames. Um, I've been in the Hamilton area since well for about the last 12 years um so I lived in Hamilton for about eight and then I've been living in the outer areas in a small town called Narawawahia for about four years now um and yeah have been uh in my role as education coordinator at Waikato Kui Youth for oh just over three months now um but previously I guess a similar experience to Nathan where um 
yeah, I was growing up in Thames and a teacher identified that Waikato Queer Youth had started over in Hamilton. And so that teacher would bring myself and a couple of friends over each week. Um, and just to put that into context, it's about an hour and a half drive. So it was really epic that we had a teacher that was so committed to that. Um, and then I guess for me, I've just kind of come in and out of the organization throughout my life. So as a as a service user, as a young person, um, and then I had quite a few years where I was a youth mentor for the organization. Um, and then recently have had the capacity to come back in um, as an employee, which has been really exciting. Um, and yeah, for me, I found growing up in a very small rural community, there wasn't there wasn't any representation and there wasn't any access to support. So um, I have a huge passion for, I guess, making sure that the experiences of rainbow young people aren't the same as the experiences that myself and I'm sure a lot of other people have had. Um, and so, yeah, I think as an organization, um, we're currently expanding and rebranding into Rainbow Hub Waikato, um, which means that we will not only be working with youth, but be working with all ages. Um, and that's also because we've, you know, seen that there's a gap for people who come out later in life or just people who are not necessarily even coming out later in life, but not necessarily having a community or a space to connect with people. So we realized like, hey, well, you know, let's let's be that, let's make that happen and let's kind of develop all these diverse communities within our own community and celebrating that diversity within diversity. So that's a really exciting time for us. Um, and yeah, it's just... I guess for me, yeah, it all it all comes back to those experiences I had growing up wanting to make a change for others and then also going like Nathan said, rather than being like, here's where we are, everyone has to come to us being like, how can we reach our wider Waikato Hodaki area and make sure that all young queer people have access to support um, and also just to have that that connection with other like-minded peers who and people who are going through the same experiences yeah that's awesome I'm thinking um it's exciting to hear about your work um expanding out to cover all ages um and um you're talking Nathan about uh you know making it okay for young people to stay in rural communities I wondered um as part of that about uh some of that intergenerational work maybe as well like having more um visible role models or older people, <laughs> people of, of all ages, um, kind of being um, not only accepting of queer people, but maybe out as queer or trans um, in some of those smaller communities. Yeah, definitely. And we've had constant feedback from our young people about they know, um, they know who the queer people in their um, township are, and they're always told, you know, oh, you're, you're too different, or this might not be um, who, who um, our whanau is, but actually there are sprinkling, you know, more than people think of um, rainbow community members across the smaller regions, and, um, you know, it's, it's hard when you can see your family being like, oh, that's, you know, that's Auntie, Auntie Kay, you know, that we don't really hang out with Auntie Kay, and they're like, but why? And, and then they find out that that's because of you know, the parallel of their, of their identity, you're like, oh, okay, this is Auntie Kay's just living her amazing truth, <laughs> you know, <laughs> why can't I be like Auntie Kay? Um, but yeah, so the generation gap, yeah, it's people, so, yeah, statistics speak to it, but to, um, people are leaving the smaller communities to go to the urban kind of metropolises to, to seek that community and then they're losing their connection to where they've grown up. So that's a kind of a grief that happens in, and um, whether it's family um, or just community um, as a whole, but, um, and then having to reconnect again in a, in a whole new space. Um, so it's quite interesting, the, the people that we find navigating that. And um, yeah, it's part of why we're really keen to um, support that on a, high, a wider spectrum so that they can have um, healthy role models and people who are, you know, vibing in the community just as their true selves. Um, and then the people who come after our, our young people now can see like, oh, wow, you can have a really fulfilling life being, you know, true to who you are or open about who you are. Yeah, and it's safe to do so. Which is... 
Thanks, Mo. Um, one of the questions we had, uh, I think we sent through to you to have a think about is, what do you think the difference is in engaging with young people in rural areas versus young people living in more urban contexts? Um, yeah. Jump in if you want, um, Slay also. Sorry, I don't want to polarize the conversation. Um, I might do, I tend to. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so the difference between urban and rural that we see most commonly is um, that if, yeah, if the mentality that the two degrees of separation of New Zealand is so true in rural communities um, and you can't really walk down the street without seeing someone that you know or that your family knows or that knows, you know, the next person. Um, so the biggest thing we found um, we're never getting that as a youth service um, and rolling out support for young people is um, from the aspect of safety um, and that generally when you're supporting young people confidentiality is the biggest thing on your mind right and making sure that um, their needs are met in a safe way whereas that's really tricky to do um, in a small town where we're starting off the bat that their confidentiality is not safe because it's really hard to navigate that um, in such a small community and not just you know the rural townships that have 500 people it's you know things like um, places like um, Te Aumudu where it's quite a larger space but still everyone knows everyone um, and so navigating that as an organization you kind of think you know how can we put in safety aspects that mean that we can provide the support and acknowledge that it's not going to be confidential and they're not going to have that same um, safety mechanism as in say Hamilton um, and what extra um, support and um, things we need to put in. Um, and an example that comes to mind is um, like the, the young person that, that I mentioned at the cafe is that um, we were really excited to be offered a space in the community house um, to use for free for our youth groups because before that we were just meeting kind of picnic style um, in like a really cool um, park because that was you know out of the way but easily accessible for the young people. Um, but you know winter rolls up, <laughs> can't can't stay outside for long. Um, so yeah, we we're really lucky to be offered a space in the community house. Um, and through talking with the young people and saying like, hey, isn't it cool this has happened? Um, what do you think? They were like, oh, um, you know, my my aunt my aunt and my my uncle both work there, and I'm. I wouldn't be able to come then and, I, and was like oh okay cool so the best thing I suppose to think about um when engaging in on the ground work like that is checking in just because it seems cool for the organization checking with a young person first like hey you know what spaces do you know of and that you would be comfortable meeting and that um that really youth-led aspect comes through in these spaces because they can tell you quite clearly um and you know, firmly where they feel comfortable or not. And so you can go from there as a starting point rather than, oh, cool, this is what I think would be the bigger picture and looks great and shiny um, and warm in this nice space. <laughs> Making me think of not necessarily even a rural story, but um, someone I worked with who did a lot of work with school counsellors. And um, uh, there was a school where like nobody was going to see the school counsellor but the office um, we had to go to was like on the other side of the field and so to be able to <laughs> go have an appointment you had to like walk across the field and everybody could see you walking over there um, and how they turned it around was that the counsellor got a toasted sandwich maker and so then the whole thing was like you're going to just like get a toasted sandwich you're not going <laughs> you know it sort of reduced the, the stigma around it and um it's just making me think of that yeah that sort of visibility of like if you've got a particular place that's like the queer place in town and everybody knows that that's what it is um then yeah even just physically going there um would be a challenge i imagine um so did you have anything else to add around that question sort of what's the difference that you see in engaging with young people in rural areas in those small towns like where you um grew up versus an urban context yeah, I think um, you can definitely see how, like, I guess I see a huge importance of an organisation like ours, which is rural-based, working with rural people, because there's such a difference between the experiences. I remember when I was 19 and I moved to Auckland for a year and I was like, it, it felt like I just walked out the door and everyone was part of the queer community and I was like wow this is so different this is such a different experience 
And then meeting so many people my age who were so much more comfortable with themselves, so much genuinely authentic, showing up in the world. And I was still like trying to figure out who I who I was because I hadn't seen that before. Like it just wasn't accepted. And so in a rural community, there's it's not necessarily that things are backwards still, but there still is that like the representation isn't there and the acceptance isn't necessarily there either. And so it's like, it's, it's almost a bit of a struggle if you try and, you know, take, I suppose, what works in the city and take it into a rural community. And so that's why it's really important that we've got these spaces where we can have those conversations. And it's all about, I guess, anyone that's working with, with young people, but especially in those rural communities is not going, here's what I've got for you, take it. It's actually being like, what do you want? What do you need? What is going to make this work for you where you can get the support you need, where you can you know, have that socialization with people you wanna have, but also have that, I guess, that anonymity because it is, it's like in a small community, like everyone knows everyone. I mean, I'm an adult, but still like my mum knows more about me than I know about myself. And I don't even live in that town anymore because everyone just is constantly kind of just commenting on everything that everyone does. I call it, I guess, that small town mentality. And I guess it's just natural for people. But now that I'm out of it, I'm actually like, why does everyone have a need to talk about everything that everyone else does and so that is where it's like you can't just go and necessarily hang out in a in a local cafe or something in particular towns because it may not feel safe or people will be like oh I saw your son and they were at this thing with these people and it's like it just yeah it's it's definitely a lot different whereas you know in the city obviously so many more people with such a, a bigger space and a, I guess a lot easier to not kind of bump into everywhere everyone you know everywhere you go so it's really just being really respectful and mindful of that and then also as well if you've got I suppose a, a small core group of young queer people who are a bit more comfortable with themselves I've noticed sometimes there's an expectation on like oh well, hey like why don't you be the rainbow flag bearers for your community and why don't you do the education and why don't you do the advocacy but it's like hey the young people like that's not their responsibility as well so also trying not to like monetize something that shouldn't be and just really making sure that their, their needs are met and that they're getting the support that they need and understanding that yeah you'll need to have those conversations with those people because what we think it looks like compared to what it actually Actually, they think it looks like can sometimes be polar opposite so it's just really important to understand that yeah talk to the talk to the young person find out what they want they need and then make decisions from there around the best ways to support them with them being always part of that conversation yeah cool and we just had a question come through from one of our participants which is just around um, how best can we support Arangatahi from in, in rural spaces when we can't go to them and meet them where they are physically? Um, I guess from my perspective, it would be, and because they will, it's not that every young person in a rural community wants to stay in that rural community. There are some that, are, if they were supported in those spaces, want to stay there. There's other people who might want to, you know, might want to move to the city or, or relocate and do their own thing. Um, and so I guess it's starting off with that, that understanding that um, it's not necessarily everyone's I know from my experience, for example, I would never ever move back to the town I grew up in because that's not something I would ever want to do. Um, so for me, it was quite an easy move. Um, but I think in regards to just working with our young people or working with, you know, Rainbow Rangatahi from those rural spaces in, in a city environment, um, I guess it's really kind of once again it, it probably sounds like the same answer in a way but everyone's experience is going to be different and so I think really asking them for example like asking them what their experience has been like because they might turn around and be like 
oh, I've been out since I was 12. My family is supportive. I've got some supportive teachers. I've got some really good friends. I've had a really great experience. Whereas they might be coming to the same group, bringing someone with them who is like, I've grown up in the exact same community at the exact same school, but I have, you know, had not had an accepting family and the people around me have not been inclusive and I've had really bad experiences with the school system. So you can have, you know, people from the exact same, literally in a rural community, people living on the same street who will have polar opposite experiences. So it's really starting off by figuring out what it has looked like for them. Um, and then I would say if they're coming into a city space, but having to return to those rural communities, and there's not that opportunity to do, I guess, what we've been doing, which is, you know, going out into the community, is just having, I guess, things in place where they can still get support. So whether that's online groups, um, you know, mentors within the organisation that they can stay in contact with, so that when there are times where they are needing that support, where they're needing some advocacy, where they're needing some education, they're not going, oh, but we haven't got our next catch up for another week or whatever it might be. They've got people that they can keep that communication up with, um, that can keep supporting them. And so they've got that, that conversation going. Um, I guess from my point of view, that would be the most important. Um, what do you think on that one, Nathan? Yeah, that just brings me back to the um, the wider picture of what it means to be in a rural kind of like region. Um, and the main thing that came to mind was there's a huge economic disparity between people. So there's um, the people who maybe like, um, a good example I was talking about, I think yesterday, was that there's um, the farmers that have the nice farmhouse and then there's the people that work as, um, you know, the farmhands that, and they might have, you know, two youth in the same position, but um, in their identity, but they don't have the same access to services. So really thinking about um, holistically, what does your young person's life look like? How can we connect with what's already around them? So I'm always um, a huge advocate for building up um, community around young people that are there um, and the most often um, safest way for young people that you can't um, go to meet in the community is through their schools because they're they're there um, and that's somewhere that they they don't have to tell their um, community where they're going um, so if they've got parents that you know you, you've got to drive to pick them up and stuff like that um, and that's why we really um, pushed for our education coordinator role as well is because that's really where we can support young people um, where they are um, and things like um, QSAs in schools those that peer support and empowering the schools to have the right policies in place um, and that right um, leadership model so it's not um, constantly a rotation of new people leading it and you might get different um, or people who are a strong opinion, or again, relying on those, um, like um, Slay said, those those really out and proud um, young people that may be burning out slowly because people are relying on them. Um, but yeah, just building up the community around them. Um, a really good example I have from the work I did in the Bay of Plenty actually was um, Karawira, um, is a very, a town where you think, oh yeah, it's, it's all logging, um, maybe, um, you might hear about the gang activity there and you'd think that's not a really safe place for a young person to grow up um, or to be out. But um, the community was um, hungry to help. They wanted to help their rangatahi. They wanted to um, do the best they could to change the experience of the young people to what they had growing up. So all they really wanted was information and support for how. So empowering the the counselors, the doctors, um, you know, um, the schools in that area created a wraparound effect. And that's something that I really want to um, push to be mindful of as working in rural areas is that when you're there, um, it's great, have that support. But when you leave the area or you're going to the next region, um, you want that young person to still have that wraparound support and that know that they can um, reach out for help, like Slay said, and have that peer mentor or um, that the, the friend, Rainbow Friendly Council or GP that they can go talk to when you're not there because there's it's a, such a huge region. Um, that's something that we come across quite a lot. And we learned very um, early on that we couldn't 
be everywhere you can have all your um you know your staff or your volunteers in all the areas helping these young people so building up what's around them is the safest um and most <laughs> service-minded way um as well because it's yeah it, it's just the best we can do so i i would recommend um it's, it's networking but yeah um it's finding testing the water to see what the climate is like for the young person um and what yeah what's available to help them um get to your service um thinking about um you know the finances and things as well of the community it really makes a lot of sense in terms of yeah building up the community and support around where the young person is i think um when I saw that question, I, my, my mind immediately jumped to the internet as well. And um, it was interesting that you didn't talk very much about that. I wondered whether technology is um, a big part of what you do in terms of supporting youth across a wide region or um, yeah, if, if there's online support services or um, remote support services that young people can tap into as well. Um, so I think a huge part of with yeah, with bringing my role on board around education coordinator is looking at what our plans are going forward. Um, and I think, you know, once again, COVID is a really good example of when people realised like, hey, how do we support people when we're not able to go out and see them? Um, and so we're definitely looking at, once we kind of go through our shift and rebrand, looking at the online resources that we'll be able to create. So for example, if a young person contacts our organization and is like, hey, I've got questions about this, I'd like to have a conversation. We can be like, cool, we'll be in your town this week. It's a few weeks away. In the meantime, if you head to, you know, our online resource library, here's the different things that you can access. So I think for us, we definitely want to make sure that's also available. But I think as well, also making sure that it's not our main source of what we do. Um, because I think a huge part of what's important in those rural spaces and probably why we don't talk about the internet so much is the fucker for knowing a tonga side of things is like if you are a very in an isolated small town and you are a young queer person you really are wanting to meet other people and you're wanting to connect and you're not wanting to feel alone and so it's like if we were only in an online space I just feel like no matter how inclusive you make it you just can't get that same sort of like authentic connection from that face-to-face -face group activity kind of conversation um but i think as well we're very aware that we can also it's going to be like a you know having I guess face to face be the forefront of what we do but then also being like but here are these like resources which once again also understanding that there will be some people who would rather just find out about everything online to start off with and may not feel comfortable interacting with other people but I think if we can find ways of basically reaching our target audience through different methods of delivery then that's what the kind of that's what's going to really help to make a difference in those those small kind of satellite community spaces where people aren't as accessible or we're not as accessible. Yeah. Um, I just want to jump in um, as well. So there's um, there's awesome, so many awesome resources um, available on a national level, um, and also some cool online um, support services um, that you can tap into as well. But what we found over COVID was actually households more than I would have thought, um, taking my little privilege hat off. Um, I didn't even start using a computer till I was like 18, so I was very behind technology. But um, <laughs> there was, um, over COVID, we really struggled to support our young people because often they're device sharing um, or they're, um, so it's not, um, the predominantly the people that we connect with, um, they want to, learn on their own sometimes first before connecting with people but majority of the time it is people first then resources because they uh, again Alex I was saying they want that reflection of themselves first so they feel safe and um acknowledge that they are who they you know who they are and they can be who they are um and with the device sharing especially over COVID and you know we had to do some satellite bubble you know swapping just because of safety and things we found that really difficult as an organization but um yeah the device sharing was huge and, and um internet access as well like 
uh, the predominantly a lot of families on a set, um, you know, thing. So they've got homework time, um, 30 minutes of social time, um, and then that's it. That's the internet uses for that day or even that week sometimes. We had a young person tell me that they share a phone, um, uh, you know, a smartphone between their five siblings. Um, and I thought, wow, that's 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 tough to getting support in that online access. And then I also had the assumption like that's a one-off, but then I kept hearing these um, related stories. So it was not a story that was just um, a one-off. And so we kind of really thought, um, how can we respect our user-led journey where you can access the multiple um, you know, points of access for support, but then also not assume that just because um, they're rural and we can send those kind of resources to them that they'll be okay and they can access them fine. So it's really thinking about, again, holistically what that young person's life looks like. And it's it's awkward sometimes to ask young people like what, you know, what their access is like for home and stuff like that. But um, you really need to get to know them to find out what will work um, for them um, because in the past you know been a young youth facilitator I was, I was handing out all these resources have been like pat on the back me you know I've, I've I've given all these cool shiny things to this person and then I you know checked in again and they weren't reading them and I was like oh why not and they're like oh I I can't download that I can't download things <laughs> or you know I can't um that was too much um yeah I, I couldn't utilize them and so we had to think oh how how can we Get this young person this access to this cool stuff that's out there and so we reroute it through the school counselor um like i was saying like building up those communities around them so they got a lot of time to go sit um in the office and do interning but really they were actually just um doing a little bit of um you know paper shuffling for the the, the school but they were actually using that computer time so we worked with you know what we had around them um and same with a young person on a marae they were like cool come just come hang out after school with us and be around us and you can you can use the computers as you want and that really worked to um you know reach that access so it's kind of on the bigger scope is as we grow and reflect um yeah for us we've always been very people to people first as an organization and so COVID was like ah hmm digital so we've kind of been catching up on that space as as ourselves um like Slay was saying we've we've um got a lot in the in the pipe work um but yeah I think just thinking about the young person and, and reliterating that about how how we can best get that information to them yeah that really makes a lot of sense and um also too in terms of just how you're talking about your work around building up um, people's support networks locally, building up their whānau capacity, building up like um, their schools um, to support them. Um, yeah, like you were saying, Slay, that really does sound like it's a lot about whanaungatanga and conversations. It's like not necessarily, like a lot of digital technology is very um, individualistic in terms of supporting just one individual person with information or um, support. But um, it sounds like a lot of what you do is actually supporting more like the whole community or the support system. Mm. Um, another question that came through from a um, participant is, what is the best way from your experience if you're working with rangatahi from rural spaces in a metropolitan city that are then going to return to their rural hometown? Um, this person says they understand it's quite a difference adjusting from rural to metro and then metro to rural. Um, yeah, it's interesting because I'm like, it kind of speaks around, I guess, what, what Nathan was just saying, because if they're coming into, you know, a metropolitan city in a metropolitan space and then having to return to rural, it's once again, if you just go, oh, well, here's all these resources or here's these things that you can access. And I'm like, we don't know what people can access. We don't know what their living situation is. We don't know what their family's socioeconomic status is. We don't know if they are living with their family. Like there's so many different things around it. And it's once again, if we assume what that person can access or what that person needs, then we're making a mistake from the beginning. Um, and so, yeah, it is really good to, if, you know, if you have a specific person or a specific group of people that you're thinking about, actually sitting down with them and being like outside of this group space, like how 
how are you able to access support and how would you be able to access resources? Um, and so, for example, say that person, you know, said, oh, well, I, I won't be able to at home or like I'm finding the biggest issue is within my school. That's where we would look at being like, OK, how do we get our organisation within the school to do some education um, so that people can actually get a bit more understanding around you know our takatapu we and the queer community um but yeah it's that really understanding like what what back home looks like for them because um rural is once again so many diverse spaces and once again you can have two people living on the same street who have completely different experiences and completely different accessibility um i know for myself when i was a young person like we had a computer but it was a shared family computer so there was absolutely no way that i would ever go online to look anything up um you know like i can remember being in my head being like wanting to google like am i gay but then i'm like well what if you know someone else goes to type am I and that comes up as a suggestion from history you know all of those different things that may not seem like a big idea to people like I know that I live in a lot of privilege where I'm like I you know all of my devices are my own and so I'm like I can do whatever I want without worrying that you know someone would do that but I'm like I didn't have that as a young person and a lot of people won't have that so really looking at what yeah what accessibility they have um and if there's none there then having a conversation with them around what would work or if there's any spaces within the community that we could support them getting access to things um which will once again make that huge difference because you know they're the school I went to, we didn't have computers, so it wasn't even that option either. It's not like I could do it at lunchtime. And um, so, yeah, it, it's just really, once again, really having a conversation with the individual or the group of people that are accessing like a non rural setting based group um, and having a look at what their landscape looks like. Actually, once again, it comes back to that that people first that, you know, for knowing a tongue are actually getting to know those young people that are coming into a service having a look at what their life looks like outside of that service and then seeing of seeing how we can be of service to them in those spaces. Yeah. Um, also, um, a really important thing to think about is their mental well-being with moving between um, this amazing supportive um, kind of wraparound feeling of it's okay to be who you are, rainbow euphoric area, to going then being in a situation where they feel um, that just you know just for like oh I, I feel fractured in my community I want to connect with my um peers and stuff but it don't feel like you know you feel like you're wearing a mask um so supporting the young person around their mental um well-being is really important when they're shifting that um as a young queer person um I was quite lucky to live predominantly in Hamilton um so I did have access to um a queer, well, it was wacky, so a queer support group. Um, but I still remember um, the first time I went to uh, a queer um, or rainbow young person gathering or overnight stay. That was kind of our first introduction. Me and my sister um, were um, like invited after we went to this workshop to come hang out to this overnight camp. And we're like, oh, that's weird. Okay, yes, sure. Um, and it was great. It was amazing. Um, and I've been to so many youth hui since, um, and actually adult hui. Um, but there's this thing that we colloquially call is a, a hui hangover. And that's because you're tired because you've been up so late chatting with your peers. But also that sense of you're in a situation where you're you feel so enwrapped and empowered and then you leave that and then so you feel like you're leaving a part of yourself in this area to go back to your what's normal and that not you know the everyday kind of life that you're not spending you know up to 3 a.m chatting about like life wishes and stuff with young people um and that's kind of it is a little bit of a culture shock and even if you're doing that every week like bringing a young person to um a group you know and then bringing them back to their home life or the community um they're, they're going to feel that so that's a lot of um up and downs uh mentally and emotionally for the young person so again um speaking to what Slay was saying about Whanangatanga is that's why I'm so passionate about supporting the community so they can then um have that when they get back it might not be to the same degree but they can see that 
maybe it's changing and that gives them hope and that's the thing you kind of really want to latch onto is giving them hope that um it's not just the urban areas that are amazing you know central rainbow metropolises it, it can happen in rural townships if they're given the right tool sets um and the time to change as well time is a big thing that's really hard to communicate to young people even myself i'm so impatient um, <laughs> um but letting them know that you know there is things changing and the, the rainbow support that is there that you know of in the um the areas like um like i was saying if you if you know there's four well one four one or four um supportive gps and you're like hey you remember dr such and such they used to be really um ignorant in the ways that they spoke to you around your your body and oh uh, you know the things you told me about what they said but now you know from how you, um we've helped them and you've kind of let them know that that's not how you identify and that sort of thing um and we've given them resources and training and you know access to wider training that they're, they're trying and they want to try because um small communities are very interconnected and um like slay was saying they do talk about everything but just starting that conversation and getting them to think they are hungry for it they want to keep that sense of community they don't want the young people leaving most of the time they don't want anyone leaving most of the time they want to keep their you know their wrap around um because yeah i i love living in an urban metropolis but i also um i love rural mentality and just how you it's it's okay just to like smile and wave to someone down the street and you know that they've seen you um so having that space where you can make it or help empower that community to be that safe space for that rainbow person so they can then be their rainbow self walking down that street getting those waves and acknowledgements instead of the oh oh there goes margaret's kid <laughs> um <laughs> um is really important so they don't constantly feel that up and, and down and that stuck the feeling of stuck in their situation Yeah, that really makes a lot of sense. Again, I was thinking about technology because I know, um, you know, speaking to some of the young ones that I work with um, or connect with um, in more urban settings, a lot of what they would do if they were going home from a hui, you know, they might be experiencing that hui hangover, but they'd set up like group chats or they'd be making a little Facebook group to connect with each other. And again, with that, um, people not necessarily having access to technology to be able to um, access that for themselves in their day-to-day -day lives um, that could be a real real barrier a real difference um do you think there's a difference in what's needed between a difference in need between rural and urban rainbow young people uh i'd say yeah 100 percent definitely um i think like i guess a lot of people have the the perception that the majority of New Zealanders or the majority of spaces in Aotearoa, even though like our big cities aren't necessarily that big, so therefore there's not much of a difference. It is just such a different experience growing up in those spaces. And, you know, it is going back to things like seeing representation. Um, for example, like at the moment, if you're in the city going into a mall, whatever it might be. Um, there's currently like billboards up everywhere around the sweat with pride promotion, you know? So it's like literally everywhere I go, I'm seeing um, promotion around that. And I'm like, oh, like that is a queer fundraiser. How epic is this? Whereas I'm like, I'm telling you now, I was never gonna see that in the mall in Thames. <laughs> um, and so it's like, once again, it's like there's that instant validation, which even as a queer adult is still really validating because it's like, oh, that's in a public space. Um, and as well, like when we really look at the needs around what young queer people need, it's once again, like a rural community, there's, there's is the negatives, but there is also the positives to it. And so it's like, sometimes those can also be the same thing. Like Nate was saying, like, a negative might be that like everyone knows everyone but then the positive from that is like well everyone is in knowing of who each other is and it comes down to I guess what what a rural community looks like 
and that is the fact that everyone will know each other and people do want to have that wraparound support and so it's like that's not necessarily the same in an urban environment because you know going from rural where you can be um next door neighbors and know everything about each other i've known that when i've lived in urban spaces i've had next door neighbors that you never even meet because of the way that things work and so in regards to how that affects the needs of like young queer people in a rural setting it really comes back down to i guess identifying with them once again like what they've had access to what they want what they need and it's yeah it, it has to be designed by the young person because those experiences in rural communities are so diverse between each individual person it's kind of going okay well you know what are your expectations what is going to what does a safe inclusive space look like to you what does support look like to you what does education look like to you um what do you want to see happening within your community what do you want to see happening for yourself actually having those conversations to then identify that particular need and deliver it in a really safe way which once again it sounds like a repetitive thing but it's such a challenge when there is once again so many different accessibility issues and so it's like let's keep having those conversations and working with those young people to identify what their needs are in those rural spaces and not trying to drag them out of those spaces actually going okay how can we meet you there or at least meet you in the middle to show you support um also the the age of information is kind of coming and we're in it i guess but um the, you can't assume that that everyone in rural communities will have the most updated information. Um, one of the kind of examples I have of that is um, when you think of pride, a pride, you know, a pride parade, you think quite promiscuous still, you know, that sort of like open show of um, identity, but that often gets translated into um, open sexuality, um, uh, you know, open promiscuity. And a lot of conversations I've had in supporting family members um, kind of teeter on the edge of um, kind of if they're not understanding um, why the young person is the way they are. Uh, um, their main fears are, one, they're going to be very promiscuous and overly sexual and have all these risque sexual encounters, um, which is an awkward conversation to have with a parent. Um, or... Um, grief that they're not going to have they're fearful for the young person they're fearful about what their life will be like within their own community so they want the best for them so what they think is the best for them is not to be um you know out um or um in terms of transitioning and things like they don't know what their life will be like so that you're grieving that child's um projection you you can't help it as a parent but you've projected the life of your child right you can imagine the babies the the weddings you know that sort of thing so they um they can't they can't that's a very broad thing but the majority of time I spoke to um parents they were struggling with the concept of you can have a fulfilling life because what they had seen in their generation was the struggle the death the promiscuity um you know the living alone as a spinster um so trying to trans <laughs> there's a very old parents um <laughs> um trying to empower them to have more information and again that positive um, representation of what rainbow families look like and can be like um is it's a struggle but it's also kind of I, I love having those conversations and seeing those ch ch those evolving um evolving um mentalities because they really do just want the best for the young person and the best for their family and the best for the community so showing them that it doesn't have to be um at odds with each other um, and making sure they have access to resources, um, whether it be online or in person or um, us um, or another organization running workshops, you know. Um, yeah, because I think that's the biggest um, difference of need is that access is not the same, like Slay said. And a lot of um, a lot of services that um, you know, are based in rural areas, uh, sorry, um, metropolises don't, they have grey areas where, um, you know, if you're too far out, 
um, you're expected to come into the next biggest town because that's where they're gonna that's where they have funding to be or that's where they have staff or you know and that's not always the case that that's available for those um, people that you're trying to support. Kia ora, thanks for that. I think we're heading towards wrapping up. Um, but just if people want to connect in with you or your work, um, what's the best way of doing that? Or are there, and are there, is there anything else you want to um, plug or suggest or um, talk about at this stage before we wrap up? Uh, yeah, so we have, we're in the middle of um, building a new website, but we currently have a website, um, wakatakui.com, um, and that is, it's got a little contact form and some information. Um, it's a little bit like a standing page at the moment, so it's got information about um, what we do, but um, we've got a big shiny website coming, which is exciting. Um, and um, I'll also push like, um, Bump Slay's role as well, because um, connecting in with... Um, any education workshops and stuff that you want. Um, I highly recommend Slay, they're amazing. <laughs> um, three months in, but ruling the roost. Um, and um, yeah, just connecting in with us, uh, we do advocacy, we do education, you know, we do peer support group. Um, and at the moment we're um, doing a lot of work empowering um, schools but also QSAs because like I said that's a, a pretty um, epic way I think of supporting young people and making sure that they um, have support when it's a bit tricky um, so any kind of questions you want to throw at us or if you're if you're wanting a queer friendly um, GP or if you've got um, queer friendly or rainbow friendly um, connections that you want to throw at us we can add to our, our database we love that um, so that mutual um, you know, sharing of networking. I love networking because, um, again, I'm uh, I love creating pockets of uh, social change and support. <laughs> um, yeah, and um, yeah, um, the website's the best way to get a hold of us. Otherwise, um, you can email us at info at wakadokuiyouth.org. Thank you. Um, so, is there anything else you wanted to say before we wrap up? Um, just here once again, I guess that, yeah, if there is anyone who is, I guess, trying to work with rural communities, but is, def is, is stuck, um, then yeah, definitely get in touch with us so we can support you. Um, yeah, and if you are in the kind of Waikato, Hauraki region, um, and think that there's a way that we can help you in regards to establishing a QSA within a school, doing some education with a school, um, bringing our Where's Wacky group to a community that you're part of, um, then definitely get in touch because once again, it's we're all about kind of people first, coming to our rainbow young people and just making sure that they have the best experiences they can growing up in, in a rural setting. Yeah, kia ora. Hilda, thank you both so much for everything you've shared. It's been awesome to hear about your experience and um, a lot of the ways that you support um, people across your region. Um, and I think there's a lot to learn from people working across other regions as well. Um, thank you both. Um, as I was saying, this is the fourth in a series of webinars um, for the youth sector. Our next one is next week. Um, so we've got Nehana, Nix and Taiko joining us to talk about addressing rainbow homelessness and housing and um, some of the work that they do um, supporting young people who are either homeless or at risk of homelessness and their whanau. Um, so you can register for that one now um, on our website or otherwise keep an eye on our website and social media for other um, sessions coming up. We're on Instagram, Facebook and LinkedIn. Um, and we've also been posting recordings of these sessions on YouTube. So you can go back and watch any of the ones that you've missed um, and like and subscribe and all of those sorts of things. Um, otherwise, kia ora, yeah, thank you very much for being here with us today. And we'll see you again soon. And I'll just close us with uh, karakia, karakia tato, unuhia, unuhia, unuhia ki te uru taku nui, kia wātia, kia māma, te ngāko, te tīnana, te wairua, te aratakata. Koya rai rongo fa kaire ake ki ronga kia tina tina. Uye, taikie. Thanks everyone.